This is the exact four step process that I'd use if I had to start video editing again. Now for context, my name's Malice and I've been editing for four years now. I started on that laptop that my dad got me for high school and now I'm doing this full time. I've had multiple 10K months and I've worked with some of the largest channels on YouTube. My work's gotten over a quarter billion views, but that's enough of me. Let's get into this exact four step process that got me to where I am. The first one being, Sounds obvious, but just edit some damn videos. Now I know that is pretty obvious, but hear me out. I remember when I was sort of starting out trying to get the ropes off Premiere. Before me having that laptop, I couldn't even afford a laptop, which meant I would edit on my PS4 using something called Share Factory. Now, if you think that editing on a keyboard and mouse is hard, Try doing it on a DualShock 4 controller where all you have is two analog sticks and like four buttons. So when I first got my laptop and I was able to install Premiere, not run it well, but install it at all, the first thing I did, it wasn't open the software or try edit a video. It was I went on YouTube and I searched up how to edit on Premiere Pro. Now, what do you think I found? Was it an exact step-by-step -step guide? Was it a short, concise thing? No, it was multiple 10, 20 hour guides on how to edit. And guess what my dumbass did? I actually watched them. Now, cool, I feel super motivated. I come back to my room, to my laptop, and I'm clicking away, opening up Premiere, and I'm ready to start this video with all this newfound knowledge in my mind. And I have no idea how to even get the footage. No worries, I go into Google, I find some practice footage, and now I put it into my timeline. Wait, 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 how do you do that again? So step by step, I'm having to go back to Google search up what I have to do and then implement that. And it seems as though all that information that I just learned was forgotten. Now, the reason I say this story is just to highlight the fact that when you're starting out, you don't actually need all the information in your mind. All you need to do, in fact, for the first maybe 10, 20 videos, you're literally going to improve exponentially, not by learning how to edit, but by just editing and figuring it out as you go. Now, are resources, are tutorials useful? Yes. But do you need to watch a 10, 20 hour video if you're just learning how to create some keyframes? Probably not. You'd probably learn more just by trying it out. So what I would do if I just got started now, I mean, that meme which went fuck around and find out, honestly, it's got a lot more truth to it than most people think. Now, the second stage of this entire process if I was starting video editing again would be to play to my strengths. Now, me and you, we both have strengths. But here's the thing, we both have weaknesses too. I might present myself as like this guy who knows all about editing. I have my weaknesses too within editing. Now, here's the thing, you have strengths and you have weaknesses too. So does every other editor. The difference between the editors that do well and the editors that struggle is the editors that do well play to their strengths while the editors who don't do so well try to see what other people are doing where they're playing to their strengths and they try playing the same game. But here's the thing, if you play someone else's game without wondering whether it's something you'll win or not, you pretty much always lose. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you're someone where you have a ton of social proof. You have millions and millions of subscribers of clients. Your work's gotten hundreds of millions of views. You've worked with these huge channels in all these different niches. In fact, you just got so many people where creators would come to you just because you've worked with these people and you've gotten these results. Social proof, meaning things that you can share that you've done it for other people. That is a game you can play and a game that you'll win. But what if you are someone that you're just starting out, maybe you've gotten your first few clients, maybe your work is pretty solid, but you haven't done it yet on huge, huge channels. Is social proof and sharing how many views you've gotten and sharing the number of subscribers that your clients have, is that a game that you'll win? Probably not. The strength that you have relative to your visuals, your sound design, your actual, your clients, sort of all of these things, your strength might just be your actual videos. So here's the thing, you wanna look at the stage of that now and ask yourself, what is the game that I should be playing? Because if I tried playing the 3D game where let's say all of this Blender stuff, I'll be totally honest, I'm not a big Blender guy. I don't know how to do this crazy 3D stuff where I create the CGI animation. 
But if I tried presenting myself as someone on my portfolio where I did that, the guy that's better than me, even if he has less clients, would win that game. But then if I played the social proof game, which honestly I do now because of the stage I've gotten to, this is where I would win. So you want to think about the game you can, you can play and it's not binary. It's not about whether you should only have social proof or only focus on your videos in terms of showing it to potential clients. It's more how much should I focus on just my videos? How much should I focus on my social proof? When you're starting out, you're literally just focusing on your videos because you have no social proof, but you want to slowly build it as you go. Now, to put this more actionably, what this looks like is going onto your socials, going into your portfolio, going into the way that you share your work and the way you present yourself online and ask yourself, what I'm sharing, the statistics, the videos, all of these things, are these my strongest assets? Now, they might not be perfect, but relative to your other sort of skills your other sort of areas like your social proof or your retention if you're trying to tell people you've maximized retention but you've never actually had proof of that but you do have work where you can actually talk about visuals why not play a game that you'll actually win it's like if we got mike tyson and we got him into a boxing competition if we got prime mike tyson in there he'd probably win but take that same guy and throw him into a ballerina competition and suddenly he'll probably struggle. Now, maybe since he's retired, maybe he's become an amazing dancer, but likelihood is Mike Tyson wins boxing, loses a ballerina competition. Same guy, just a different game. You wanna be Mike Tyson playing boxing, and if you are a ballerina, you can play your ballerina game too. But just play games that you're gonna win. Now, the third stage is where we get feedback cycles in order for you to improve both your social proof, so who you're working with, the numbers, the retention, the number of subscribers, the views, all of that stuff and showing that as well as your actual videos. Now, a lot of people think that I can either improve my work or I can work with clients, but that's not actually true. In fact, they both help each other. So here's the thing. If you were trying to improve at basketball and I told you, hey, you've never played basketball before, just imagine you haven't. And I told you that by the end of the week, you have to at least get to a point where you could hold your own ground in the game. If you've never played basketball before and you started watching tutorials on the exact wrist movement to use, the exact foot stance and the exact way your hips should move at a two degree angle anti-clockwise, like if you looked into all these things but you've never thrown a damn basketball into the hoop, you're probably not gonna improve by much. At first, it just helped to just throw the ball in the basket and then maybe once you've thrown it 100, 200, 300 times, then yeah, like you've gotten the grips of it and now it makes sense to look into a little more of the technical stuff. So the actual action helps with more of the softer skills of now I know what to learn, I know where to look. And now when you go research, when you go look for videos on how to play basketball that also helps you actually playing they feed into each other the same way you improving at client work is the exact same way where you improve your visuals you improve your actual videos you get clients their videos now become the practice videos and when you do those videos well which we'll talk about in a second but when you do those videos well that's when it helps you get more clients and it becomes this beautiful feedback cycle where the best way to improve is actually to get clients it's funny how the best editors, it's less about where they actually are now, because here's the thing, everyone started without knowing how to edit. The best editors you know all started without a single client, just like you. I mean, the only thing is they just had more client flow, meaning they were working with more and more people, meaning they got more and more reps into the game. I remember around two years ago when I was working on a project at a stage where I was improving really fast in my editing and I'd gotten this project, it was paid and I got it paid up front. And what actually happened is I'd left it till the last day. Now I had a whole week deadline. I'm not gonna get into why I procrastinated all of that stuff, but nonetheless, I got to the last day and it still wasn't done. Now I had around 12 hours to get this video done and I knew it would probably take me another one, two days. But here's the thing. I was so scared of losing that client that I ended up just cramming it into basically one or two sessions. Now, I'm here sitting and I'm thinking I'm never gonna get this done. But the strange thing is by the end of the 12 hours, by the deadline, I actually still managed to get it done. Now, looking back at it, I can see why that is, but at the, in the moment I was like, dude, time just flew by and I somehow just locked in out of nowhere. How has this happened? 
looking back at it, I can tell, I mean, desperation is the mother of innovation, where you will perform no higher than you are required to perform. And what that means is you cannot force yourself to work unless there's an actual reason to work. If I told you right now, get up and do 10 star jumps, you probably wouldn't do it. In fact, maybe there's one person that has, but most people wouldn't. But if you were in a situation where I said, both your parents would die unless you did 10 star jumps, you'd probably do the 10 star jumps. Just because I told you to do it, doesn't mean that you'll feel compelled to do it. Just because you want to edit a video and you want to feel motivated, doesn't mean you'll actually do it. It's only when stakes are on the line. And it's when you have actual client work where you've done the outreach, you've done, you've built the inbound system, you've built like the reliable client acquisition systems, and now you're working with people. And now, even if you're not the best at editing, you are forced to perform. Now, to some people that might sound scary, but if you're a lot more like me, I kind of like that pressure. I like to know that I can look back after a project and be like, damn, that took basically a lot of work, but I am so much better after that. You don't get that feeling when you're doing practice work because honestly, there's nothing forcing you. When you are working with clients, there's a reason, there's a bar you have to reach and that fear, I would say, is a healthy one. Desperation is the mother of innovation. You'll perform as well as you need to perform. And the fourth stage that I would go into if I had to start video editing again is I would think so much longer term. I remember when I was first starting, I was 16 years old and the type of client work that I first got were these gaming montages, like these gaming videos where it was just these clips of a guy getting killed and I had to edit it. Now, these were being paid around $5, $10 per video and it'd take me multiple days to do. I remember just trying to cram in my workflow and just cramming in the amount of work I'm doing into as little time, even if it sacrificed the quality. And my thought process was this, I'm getting paid like 10, 20 bucks. I just wanna get this done out of mind and then I can move on to the next client because this guy clearly isn't paying me enough. I was so flawed in my thinking because here's the thing, you don't get paid for a project from the actual project and hear me out. The payment from a project is actually in the social proof and the evidence that you build for future clients. So I had a client called Sona. She has about, we got her to about a million subscribers now. Her most viewed video on her channel has 5 million views and it's mine. So I came in with this client and I sort of said like, hey, this video, cool. I outreached to her. She replied three months later, we worked together and I told her that the video would take a week. I told her it'd take a week and I mean, a week later it was not done. I asked her for an extension and she kind of understood the fact that I wasn't lying. It wasn't the fact that I was lazy. I sent her sort of a screenshot of the timeline. I said, yo, Sona, this video, I see so much potential in it. I genuinely think that if you just give me a little more time, this will be the best video I've ever made. Now, she understood me. She was an amazing, amazing client. And I took another week on it, but here's the thing, after an another week of actually working on the video, not procrastinating, so every day I'm spending like five to 10 hours a day while in school. So I'm working before school, I'm doing a couple hours, after school I'm doing like another five hours and then I'm working late into the night. I'm actually doing this work. It took me three months to finish the entire project. But here's the thing, when I sent it in, she wasn't exactly mad because I had actually just created one of the best videos that not only she had seen, but I had seen as well. Now, that is what we call over delivery. It's where you exceed someone's expectations. In fact, it's one of the things I have written on my phone. I don't know where it is. It, one of the first words on my phone is over delivery. Always exceed expectations with everything you do. And when it comes to client work, well, that three month video, was it paid well? I mean, if you think that it took three months, for it to be even be a reasonable wage, you can imagine I probably didn't get paid that at first. This was a few years ago. But here's the funny thing, that one video, if I think, if I think about the hourly rate on that video, I'm getting paid under minimum wage. But that one video still gets me clients till this day. Where I've posted it on my portfolio, I've posted it on my socials, and I still get people, million, million, million subscriber clients hitting me up and I know it's because of that one video. So like, is this me telling you spend three months on a video? 
No, probably don't take it to the extreme like I did. But spending a little more time and just putting more effort into videos, even though you might not feel that it's being paid what, like it's not worth being doing it for how much it's being paid, you get what I'm saying? Honestly, the poor editors think in a way where they think project by project, the better editors, they think month by month by month. And some can even think out to a year. I'm at a stage where I can do that now in all honesty. When I was worked on that video, I just genuinely wanted to be amazing. If I was going back, I would think in terms of this project I'm doing, even if I'm getting paid five bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, what would I do with this video if I was getting paid five, 10 times more? If I'm getting paid 50 bucks a video, what would I do if I was getting paid $500 for it? Because here's the funny thing, if you want to actually get paid that one day, you got to treat the projects like that now. Because high paying clients, they're not looking for someone that can promise high quality edits. They're looking for someone that's already done it. And if you're at a stage where you've got certain clients and you want to get someone higher, you need to prove that you can already make that level of edit. So right now I charge around 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 per video. If I wanna be, imagine I was at $100 per video right now and I wanna attract someone that's at $1,000, like willing to pay that. If I show him my work and I just did what was required, he probably would be like, oh yeah, nice. Like your work is worth about a hundred bucks, awesome. But if I did that project, I treated it like it was a thousand dollar project, even though I'm only getting paid a hundred bucks, people around me saying it's underpaid. Oh my God, it's not worth it. Other broke editors saying, oh my God, I would never do that. That's what people were saying to me. But here's the thing. If you treat that like a thousand dollar project and then now you show it to that guy, suddenly you could only be at a hundred dollars, but that guy, the guy that's paying you what you want, he's now attracted to you. So make your choice. Do you want to appeal to your ego now where for one day, two days, three days, you've got your maximized hourly rate? Was that your goal? Or was it to actually have a consistent full-time income? Because the thing is, I don't think I'd ever be able to see myself where I am right now, where I'm working with these huge, huge channels, guys with 1 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million subscribers. And I'm doing this full-time, I'm 19 years old. I don't go to university, I don't have a normal job. I mean, this is my office, I fucking love it. Video editing got me here and to think that <laughs> the kid that got me here was some 16 year old dumbass when I was editing on my laptop that my dad got me for high school, which didn't have a GPU, it lagged like crazy. I'd have to put it in the freezer just in order for it to render without it crashing. Now I don't recommend that, but I'm just saying it's what I had to do. To me, going from A to Z, it feels amazing and while you might have certain disadvantages like maybe your visuals aren't the best right now, maybe your computer isn't the best, maybe your parents don't want you to edit, maybe you do have a lack of time. Here's the thing, if you just keep complaining, it doesn't fix the problem and I'm going to speak to you like brother to brother now. My goal here isn't to pity you. If you came to me and you complained about how your computer wasn't good enough or you're from this country or that country, your parents don't want you to edit, I had the same thing. So to those few editors that sort of complain and say why it would have worked for them, we can give them our pity. But in all honesty, if you are more ambitious than that, I just want to say that you can outwork your disadvantages. You may be from a poorer family. You may have parents that don't want you to edit or you do. I mean, any of these disadvantages, you may have them, you may not, but everyone, just like how everyone has strengths and weaknesses, everyone has advantages and disadvantages. Those who do well accept that, yeah, I have some disadvantages and I'll improve them, but I can outwork them. And it's when you outwork your disadvantages, it's when you think long-term, it's when you reinvest everything into yourself and you understand that, hey, there are people out there just like me who have done exactly what I want to do, who even started worse off than me, who are dealt a worse hand than me, if there's at least one person who's done that, why not me? So that's the exact four step process that I'd use if I had to get started at in video editing again. And I hope you found this useful. Take care.